as our Korean God calls us together on this third Sunday of the Easter season, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for work as our candles are lighted by Michael and <laughs> Let 
us pray together. Creator God, we give thanks for the gift of your world and all that you have made. Forgive us for all the ways that we have neglected your gifts. Give us food for us. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road 
while he was opening the scriptures to us, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, Christ has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God bless these words to our hearing and our understanding. Will you pray with me? Most holy God, may the words of my mouth and reflections of each of our hearts be faithful to the scripture of this day, that we might also see Christ alive on the road before us. Amen. Have you ever noticed that some of the saddest words in our language begin with the letter D? For example, disappointment, doubt, disillusionment, defeat, discouragement, despondency, depression, despair, death. Often I recall the statement that movie producer Woody Allen once shared when he was giving the commencement address at Yale University. He said the following, our civilization stands at the crossroads. Down one road is despondency and despair. Down the other road is total annihilation. I hope we'll take the right road. <laughs> Woody Allen was obviously trying to be funny, but his statement reflects the despair and pessimism that can sometimes overcome our lives. And this week's news might even provide a few cases in point as well. Disappointment, doubt, disillusionment, defeat, discouragement, despair, death, all of these words sum up how Cleopas and his companion were feeling as they trudged up that road toward Emmaus. They had left the downhearted and confused band of Jesus' followers who were so afraid and bewildered over what had happened to Jesus on Good Friday and that cruel, degrading death on the cross and Jesus exposed to the jeers of all those that passed by. And they had been so hopeful. And now the hopes were dashed and the dream was gone. The D words had taken over. Even the report of the woman at the Christ tomb was empty it, that it didn't even raise their spirits. It only confused them more. So these two despondent followers, two nobodies, essentially, walking the road to Emmaus, have no idea what God might be doing. That could be any one of us. They could be. That unnamed friend could have been your name or my name. The road to Emmaus was an ordinary road, the road that each of us is on every day. And as the two walked along, a stranger joined them, going down that road, and it was going to be the most significant walk in their whole lives. The stranger asked them what they were discussing. And so they poured out their whole story to someone who seemed willing to listen. They tell the stranger all about their hopes and their dreams, their despair and their disappointment. And the last thing they needed was a brisk cheer-up talk or being told to snap out of it. The stranger simply provides a listening ear. As the three talk with the stranger walking alongside of them, we know that that stranger was Jesus. Isn't it a great picture? Jesus walking along the road with despondent and confused followers sharing their troubles. And suddenly this 2,000 year old story is brought into the present. When disappointment or doubt or disillusionment or defeat, discouragement, despondency, despair or depression fill our lives, Jesus could be the unseen stranger, walking or talking alongside us, listening to us, as if we are willing to hear this voice, this love, this breaking and blessing of the bread. For in that, Jesus is revealing the real self to each of us. I think there's some truth in the story about the little boy who was asked by his mother if he knew the name of the person that God sent to walk with us and to show us the meaning of love. And the child replied, of course, it's Andy. I'm curious, she asked why. Because, he said, you know, like the song says, Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. <laughs> Tells me I am his own. So Jesus is walking and talking with Cleopas and his friend, and in listening as they talked about the cross, their bewilderment, their sorrow, Jesus reassured them, giving them a new perspective a new interpretation surrounding the resurrection. With unusual excitement, a burning in their hearts, they're reluctant to let him go. 
So they invite him to stay with them and to eat and to rest. And at supper, when they recognize him in the sharing of the bread, he then vanishes. But the experience on that road and at the table had done its work. It had transformed them, renewed them, invigorated them, and they immediately returned back to Jerusalem to find the other followers. They met Jesus alive, on the road, and invited him in. Can we say the same? Can we recognize the presence of Christ alive in our midst? I often recall an interview with the president of Cartier Company who said, I joined the company about a year after my first son died. His name was Alden, and he died of sudden instant death syndrome at one month old. When he was buried in France, the priest said something that stuck in my mind always. He said, my son had a successful life. He was loved, and he loved. That was the greatest mission in life, he said, to love and be loved. That priest interpreted the infant's life in a whole new way a way that was life-giving and life-sustaining for this grieving father. The father gained a different recognition of what his son's short life was all about. He talked of this as his road to Emmaus experience, a time when his perspective shifted and his heart burned and he knew Jesus. A young woman once told me that her mother, a tower of strength, well-read, articulate, with high standards of dignity and self-respect and integrity and respect for others, she always sent her children out the door with the words, remember whose child you are. For this young woman, these words became her Emmaus experience, a continuing encounter. Her mother was the road, the way, and when she listened, her perspective shifted and her heart burned within her. And she recognized Jesus. Another colleague shared his experience of guided meditation. As a new seminarian with a new spiritual director, he asked for a guided meditation, and this director took him on a journey in his mind to a beach. And he said, I was reading the Bible on that beach, trying hard to make sense of it. And in my meditation, Jesus approached and looked at me incredulously. Do you think I am there inside that book? Read all you want, dear friend, but I am here beside you, with you. I'm not in that book, I'm here in the world. And in that moment, the seminarian said, my perspective shifted, my heart burned within me, and I knew a sense of Jesus alive. How do we recognize the risen Christ? The answer is, anytime, anywhere, that we sense the presence of the Holy, God's presence, in compassion, in commitment, in caring, in creation. I recognize the risen Christ in a story that I received again recently. And it seems to be an Emmaus Road story about a child who was given the gift. The gift of rising out of despair to hope, and a teacher who was given the gift of rising from simply teaching to really empowering new life. It's an Easter story on the journey. And I know I've shared this story before, but it seemed like a gift that appeared to me again this week. Mrs. Thompson stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, and she told the children an untruth. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said she loved them all the same. However, that was impossible. Because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. And Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with the other children, that his clothes were messy, and he constantly needed a bath. In addition, Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in making his, marking his papers with a broad red pen and making bold X's and then putting a big F at the top of his papers. And at the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records, and she put Teddy's off until the very last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy's a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, well-liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. 
His third grade teacher wrote, <coughs> Teddy's mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest, and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn, doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends, and sometimes he sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem, and she was so ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper, except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper that he got from a grocery bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it, kind of in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter when she explained and exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day just long enough to say, Mrs. Thompson, today he smelled just like my mom used to. And after the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. And Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy, knowing that he needed to walk out of his wounds with extra loving care. As she worked with him, his mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. And by the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class. And despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that she was still the best teacher she, he had ever had in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He then wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, and she was still the best teacher he ever had in his whole life. Four years after that, she got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school, had stuck with it, and would soon graduate from college with highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had in his whole life. Then four more years passed, and yet another letter came. This time, he explained he had gotten his bachelor's degree, and he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had. But now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed, Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. And the story doesn't end there. You see, there was still yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he had met this girl, and he was going to be married. And he explained that his father had died a couple of years ago, and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit at the wedding in the place that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. And of course, Mrs. Thompson did. And guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with several rhinestones missing, and she made sure she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel like I was special and showing me that I could make a difference. And Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you had it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. This was an Emmaus Road moment. <coughs> A moment of perspective shifted, and she could say, in keeping with the gospel message for today, my heart burned within me. I recognize the risen Christ. Whenever we feel the presence of the Holy, God's presence, a care and concern for our, our life, there is Christ alive on the road with us. I love this story of the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. It's one of my favorite gospel passages, and I could read it again and again because I always discover new messages within the Easter story. It's all about two people who move from despair to hope, from sadness to joy, from cold numbness to hearts burning within them. They recognize Jesus who met them on the road to Emmaus. They recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread, and as the crumbs fell to the table, their hearts burned within them. And we too can recognize Jesus on our road 
and at our tables. If we're open with our lives to walking and talking and listening to Christ's message of love for each one of us. The road to Emmaus is a road of companionship where Jesus desires to walk with each of us. We can meet Jesus on the road of our everyday lives and in the blessings that we receive also here in this church family. We can change our personal perspective about the meaning of life and find new ways of deepening our faith attitudes and disciplines. I watch as the courage to make friends and get involved happens here, as relationships deepen, as despair lifts. As I reflect on the gospel message this morning, it seemed as if we in this congregation are on the road to Emmaus. And when we recognize the holy right here in our midst, we dare then to tell our story. For we seek to be faithful, energetic, creative, caring people who have a wonderful history as a congregation and as a body of believers. And whether you've been here since childhood or if you've walked through our doors for the first time today, our faith story celebrates the spirit of what it means to be part of recognizing the body of Christ as a church and its mission. And it reminds us of the tremendous power there is in relationships and connections that bring us to the presence of God in the breaking of our bread. We make the common bread holy, and we make our life sacred by giving of ourselves, our time, our money, our care, our love. Beyond the empty tube and the conflicted feelings of the followers, we dare this morning to focus on the Easter message from the Gospels for each one of us. Let's go back to the heart of the matter, which was very much the experience of the two on that way to Emmaus. When they were at the supper, Jesus took the bread, broke it, and blessed it, and they recognized Jesus. Almost immediately, he vanishes into thin air, but the experience on the road and the table has transformed them forever. Did not our hearts burn within us? Jesus is with us, with us today. The disciples in our story move out of their depressing despair and disappointment by breaking bread and sharing a common meal. And as part of them, we, who have walked the road and broken bread with each other, we can be transformed. Here in our faith community, we've held babies in our arms. We've prayed for them. We've promised to nurture them as they're baptized. We've celebrated in the joy of weddings and wept as we've lost our beloved ones. We've felt the burning in our hearts on Palm Sunday as our church school children filled the aisles and the altar waving palms and reminding us that this is a safe and loving place for all God's children, no matter their age or their energy level. We've prayed with one another around tables at Monday Thursday and Easter Sunday, and we've laughed together in the holiness of humor. <clears throat> we've shared many meals together. We've fed many families with life-giving food. We've been part of the transforming part and power of witness from here to Haiti, and we continue to empower others to recognize the risen Christ through our carry. Christ alive enabling others to know the companionship of that Emmaus road. We've heard beautiful music that lifts our hearts in joyful praise or that pulls us into the depths of our souls. The word of God has been danced here, sung here, dramatized here, preached here, and most of all, lived here. And on this Sunday, when we remember Earth Day, we prayerfully commit to find even more ways to recycle and reconsider new steps to honor the changes that are essential for our climate and the future generations that follow us, conserving our Earth's resources. May our eyes continue to be open to recognize what is most important on the roads that we walk and honor the future for life to continue. Christ alive in our commitment to care for our Earth and our environment. And so, like those two on that road to Emmaus, may we be transformed by the power of God, alive in the midst of this, our faith community. And may our D words be deepening, determination, dedication, dignity, daring, divine delight. Friends, the road to Emmaus invites us to walk alongside of each other in the midst of human pain and suffering and in the midst of nurturing and celebration. 
The road to Emmaus invites us to expect that Christ's presence alive not only will find us, but will walk with us and talk with us. And we know that we are not alone. May we share this good news as Easter people in the living of our lives. And may it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen. And let us all who are able to rise as we sing Hallelujah, Christ the Lord. <laughs>
for strengthening vision for integrity and truth and wisdom and caring. Hear our prayers this day for peace, O oh God, for our world and even for our inner selves. Give us strength, courage for each new day, and infuse us with the living love of Christ as we seek to be your people alive. Continue to guide us. For we offer all of our prayers through the name of the risen Christ. And we offer the prayer that was taught to all of the followers as we say now together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
morning. morning. We are a faith community that lives out our faith together through all of our justice and mission act and social action concerns. Our food pantry is on the porch off the county street parking lot, and it is available to anyone of need 24-7, and you can always bring food in at any time and leave it also on the porch. We ask that you recycle those bottles and cans with Massachusetts markings only, put them in the bins located at the top of the Farber Avenue parking lot. And also please contribute to the Haiti bucket, which is up at the top of the ramp every Sunday. And as I mentioned last week, our church school has been taking on a mission project each month. And for April, they are collecting items for the RS, RIS PCA, which is the Cruelty for Animals. Um, and you can bring in any type of um, dog toys, food, leashes, collars, anything dog related, and you can leave it on the porch by next Sunday. And your children should have all received one of these flyers, and they still have a few of them over on the table there. And cats. And cats. Oh, sorry. I forgot about the cats. <laughs> Thank you. Um, please check out my emails for a complete list of prayer concern names, and there are many. And always check out our Facebook page, which gets updated at least twice a week. And if there's anybody joining us for the first time, welcome. And please sign our guest book, which is located over in the corner. Um, and you can put your name in there and you can learn more about our church, get on our email list, and there are some folders there that you can take. And we are having a new member seminar next Sunday, April 30th, and there is a sign up over in the hall. And for those that were not able to complete their stewardship forms yet, we do have a basket over against the wall with stewardship forms in them. You can complete them, put them in the collection basket. You can always hand them to me and um, I will turn them into the office. And in the bulletin this week, you will see an event, Ministry Matters, an evening of conversation. And I really hope that if you are available Thursday night, you will attend this gathering. Our executive conference minister will be here. It's Reverend Darrell Goodwin, and he is such a great speaker. He is he was with us last year, or was it the year before? Two, two years ago. Two years oh, wow. Um, time just flies, but he has been here with us. He's such a good speaker. Um, he and Reverend Eric Ellie and Karen Zeal will talk about new and exciting ministries offered by the conference. Um, and you also have a chance to ask questions. And we're asking every committee um, be represented on this Thursday night. So please make sure there's at least one, two, three, or your entire committee here um, to be at this meeting on Thursday, which is from 6.30 to 8.30. And um, you do this to me all the time. Every time we have meals, I'm up here and I'm begging. And I'm doing it right now. And um, I'll do it in my emails this week. You're going to get tired of getting my emails, but you're going to get them. Um, we, have, we have a breakfast coming up on Saturday. We're trying something new. We're very excited about it. Um, ticket sales are very slow. Maybe you know you're already coming, but you haven't told us you're coming. Um, so we really would appreciate if you would buy tickets or let us know you're coming. You definitely can walk in. It is, you, know, you can do that, but we need to buy the food this week. There's also sign-up sheets over in the hall to make muffins, to make home fries or to bring in any of uh, the different types of juices. So if you can see um, Bob Frazier over in the hall today, he is going to be selling tickets. Um, and again, please, we all know that you go out and you have to have breakfast. Every one of us has breakfast every single day. And most of us on a weekend has, have a larger breakfast on either a Saturday or a Sunday. So have, share your breakfast with us. Come with us and have some eggs and bacon and sausage and muffins and potatoes and whatever else they're serving, um, just come. So it's between 8.30 and 10.30 next Saturday. So thank you, thank you. Um, and also May Day Baskets. Uh, again, it's a tradition that we've been doing as long as I've been in the church. May Day Baskets will be sold next Sunday um, after church. Um, so if you would like to make candy, you can always use some more people to make candy. You can drop it off um, in room one on Saturday uh, by 9 o'clock, um, and you can do that while you're having breakfast with us in the morning. So please do that. Uh, please take your bulletin home with you so you can check out all of our upcoming events. We have a lot of things going on. 
We ask that you enjoy your week. Always be safe and continue to reach out to others. And again, check out my prayer list and give somebody a call. Um, just even a text or an email or a call. I mean, you know how important that is to every one of them. Now let us continue to worship God with our tithes, pledges, and offerings. Things my 
thanks for all of these gifts. And may be used here and throughout your world to show forth the love of Christ alive in our world. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, we come now to the joyful feast of the people of God. All who seek to follow in the way of Christ's love are welcome and invited to this table. No one is ever excluded. Let us pray. Lord giving God, we give thanks. We give thanks for the gift of this bread and this cup. We give thanks for Christ alive right here in our midst. Bless this bread and this cup, and each one of us as we receive from that holy name of love. Amen. Friends, we remember how on that night in the upper room, Jesus took the bread, and giving thanks, blessed it, and broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this always, remember me. In the same manner, also, Jesus took the cup. And giving thanks, blessed it, and said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, which is the covenant of love. Do this also, remember me. Minister now in Christ's name, we give you this cup and this bread, and all are welcome.